Okay, so who am I? I'm Mohan Mutukumar. I'm a senior software engineer at Cavalara, the largest tech company that you have not heard of. We are in the tax compliance business and we are almost part of every transaction. So if you bought something online, uh, there is a very good chance that it went through Avalara systems. And so the, the task that my team does is we, we go over the internet, um, crawl a lot of pages, look for product information, tax changes, tariff changes, all these things. And effectively we have to run a mini Google. Uh, so given the scale of our operation, over the years, we've seen all kinds of systems. Um, I mean, if you can name it, we've done it. So the topic at hand, microservices are becoming unmanageable. So if you work at a large company or even a moderately sized company, all this would be very familiar to you. Um, these days, you know, there are more and more microservices. You have a single engineer managing 20, 30 microservice and all the plumbing code to make all these microservices talk with each other plus uh, the DevOps surrounding it. All this seems to take much longer and a lot of YAML, much longer than um, the actual business use case. You'll end up in a scenario where, let's say a business use case takes only three days, four days to build, but all this deployment and plumbing code, making and making sure everything can talk to each other, all that takes a week, two X of what it took uh, to cure to solve the actual business use case. So this is, you know, this is not a good situation to be in. So this is just to be clear, this is not a let's return to monoliths like good old days kind of talk. So this is a talk that's, I mean, this is a sentiment that's becoming popular in certain circles and I don't mistake them because, uh, you know, things used to be much simpler 15 years ago. All you had to do was just write some code, deploy that in an application server and you just had a web app. So there is a reason why we got here and those reasons just don't go away. So you cannot return back to monoliths. So let me give you a more simplified version of how things were uh, and how we got here. So this is how things were 15 years ago. You had a single service with multiple concerns. You had, a, you had all the clients actually talk to this single service. Um, so you had signups, you had multiple resources in different parts and you just saw that but a couple of things happened after that one the internet happened so instead of serving thousands of users uh, thousands of users now you had to uh, serve literally hundreds of millions of users so the internet scale happened and uh, then you know the most popular runtime node.js uh, that kind of improved the developer productivity by a lot ran only on a single thread uh, simultaneously, you had all those Moosla stop and you had, you had uh, processes with multiple cores. You had processes with 16, 32, and 64 core processes um, on the server side. But you had a runtime that ran on a single thread. So, you know, you're essentially going to be wasting a lot of cores. Uh, but a few years later, Docker came in. And one of the things that it uh, gave us was the ability to run multiple node processes, uh, processes on a single machine. So that suddenly gave you a way to utilize all those idle cores. And so people had something like this. You had multiple copies of the same app uh, running on a single machine, and you had multiple copies of the same app running across machines as well. It didn't make a difference. And you just put a load balancer in the front, and any client talks to the load balancer, the load balancer directs the um, request to any client at random, and you can just you know, serve the traffic. And so we were able to scale really well. There was a problem with this. Uh, I mean, rather than running multiple copies of the same app, it made sense to slice these app vertically and have these uh, scale up separately, right? So maybe you don't have a lot of uh, slash sign up slash login uh, requests, right? So how about we take that, we take all that and make the quintessential example of a microservice, the user service, and uh, you know deploy that separately. So people started slicing things up vertically and it also helped that most organizations also could have dedicated teams working on dedicated services um, with a limited scope, right? So people started th slicing things up vertically and it also helped that you can scale these things separately. Let's say, you know, there is a service that, that is getting a lot of traffic. You can just scale that service independently without allocating resources for everything else. So it made sense. And this is, I mean, if you ever see microservices, this is probably uh, this is a diagram that you would have probably seen already. Except 
this is not true right so this is true only uh, if only your client is the only thing that's talking to all the services only then this is true but in reality more often than not your services need to be talking amongst themselves too and so your diagram starts to look something like this and you can already see it becoming more complex than that the previous diagram showed and soon enough that since there is nothing stopping people from creating more microservices uh, it is going to look like this so this is an actual image from netflix and it in fact looks like this now imagine working with a system like this not only is this unmanageable because nobody has a complete view of the whole system and companies also have dedicated microservices uh, sorry dedicated platforms team uh, dedicated sre teams and all that just to you know uh, alleviate the pain of dealing with this complexity for the business developer uh, so not only is this unmanageable but it is also unreliable what happens if imagine working at in this environment and you want to uh, uh, you want to create a new service you want to deploy a new service you don't know what is going to break right so just as soon as you uh, deploy a new service if something uh, something is wrong it could bring down the entire entire system potentially so developers tend to work in this uh, you know frightened environment and also one thing that is often overlooked is uh, if a service call fails in a distributed transaction let's say for example if you're doing a, 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 an ordering service an e-commerce service if a service call to the payment service fails you should also revert whatever came before that right um, i mean revert the dispatch or something like that but in a in a situation like this people tend to miss that right and it's not um, it's not obvious to people that they should be reverting to uh, reverting everything that came before them so this kind of uh, makes things unreliable and we kind of got here for scalability right we wanted scalability and we sacrificed reliability and kind of uh, this seems generally true uh, any time you try to increase scalability uh, your reliability suffers and any time you in try to increase reliability by introducing transactions or locks uh, you know your scalability suffers but this is not actually true this sounds true but it's not true you can have a system that's both reliable and scalable so that's where you want to be right so is it possible to build a system like that uh, i mean we've done this in the past but it uh, requires a frankenstein's monster of systems you need complex uh, state machines involving uh, kafka queues uh, distributed logs using hcd all those kinds of things you need a centralized data store for anything that's critical all of those things and it might still break when a new service is introduced there is no guarantee and it does nothing to improve your situation with respect to rollbacks right uh, and also uh, given the number of systems involved you will have to write uh, you'll have a lot of different tools uh, deployment tools uh, ci tools all these kind of tools and you'll have, you'll have to write literally ungodly levels of yaml uh, i mean i'm i'm pretty sure nobody here enjoys writing yaml uh, yaml files so this is the situation and is there is there a better way there is a better way i mean if you uh, for, a, for an analogy if you think about operating systems operating systems have solved this hardware is unreliable just as distributed systems are network is un unreliable uh, so is the hardware so is your actual hardware right but your program doesn't need to account for that because your operating system gives you an abstraction your your operating system abstracts all this away from the actual programmer right so what we need in the case of uh, all these distributed systems is an abstraction and temporal is just that so just to give you a bit of a background on what temporal is so this is a project that's been brewing for the last nearly a decade uh, it started the, the team behind temporal was also the team behind uh, Amazon simple workflow um, and also the Azure durable functions and um, right before Temple they were working on this open source project from Uber called Cadence which is very similar to Temple um, aside from some internal differences like gRPC and Thrift. So um, Temple treats your entire application as a workflow uh, you have 
you have this idea of everything being a workflow. So everything is a series of steps that executes to completion. If you think about it, that kind of describes any any computer program, right? You have a series of instructions that just run to completion. So, uh, but what makes Temple different in this case is we have durable state, uh, unlike let's say any, I mean, no way. So they have durable state and you can do all this using code without writing any, any YAML. So uh, Temple gives you the building blocks to build your distributed system and it handles all the communication for you. So you don't have to deal with, uh, you know, writing to the right queue and all that. And it also stores your execution state such that if something happens to your workflow because of some infrastructure issue, it can just recreate that state in a different different worker, different part. So this is this kind of sounds like the missing piece in the stateless Kubernetes ecosystem if you think about it. So uh, creating a temporal system is pretty uh, pretty easy. So you have workflow functions and you have activity functions. So workflow functions in, in workflow functions, you need to specify what comes after what, and you essentially you create the state diagram using the workflow functions and the workflow functions need to be deterministic. And then you have activity functions, which can be just any kind of functions. So let me just give you a hello world example. So here you can see you have a function, uh, the workflow function, and then you have the activity function. So the workflow function uh, has a few config stuff. And then you basically specify that you want to execute this activity. And this is your activity function. All this does is just return hello plus name, your general hello world example. So this is just going to uh, return hello world to this result. And the workflow is also going to return hello plus name, right? That's, that's basically it. So here is a more complex and more useful example. Um, so let me actually zoom into the first part of the code. So here, if you see the first part of the code is just uh, me setting up some config stuff for timeouts and retries. So if you see, uh, we have some retry policies for the activities. Uh, I'll come to that in a bit. And also, you know, you are setting up, setting some timeout conditions. So the interesting piece is the bottom half. So let's, let me go to the bottom half. Let's throw away the uh, config part. So this config part, you don't actually have to specify. There are sensible defaults. So some of these are required, some of these are not. Um, it'll actually, um, for, for the things that you don't specify, it'll actually use the default value. And so this is the bottom half. So here, if you see, uh, imagine an e-commerce workflow, right? Um, just This is just a part of an e-commerce workflow. Let's say uh, you already have placed an order and now, uh, you know, you need to start subtracting from the inventory. You need to take the, uh, take the item off the shelf so that somebody else doesn't add, add it to the cart. And also you need to send the user to the payment page. And let's say you want both of these running simultaneously. And so essentially we've invoked both of these activities simultaneously. And here on line nine is where, you know, you're awaiting the result uh, by doing a dot get call. So if you uh, now both of these are going to get executed simultaneously. And here, if you see, we are using Golang's error handling primitives. Uh, the way you would normally handle errors in Golang to actually handle an activity failure. So this will, uh, based on our retry policy that you saw on the previous screen, this will already try multiple times, uh, five times, for example, or until you hit the exponential back off threshold. This will already try five times. And if it tries, if it reaches the maximum number of attempts allowed, only then it will go into this block. And here you can see, you know, if the payment info info fails, we are putting this back to the shelf. So you can just uh, handle the compensation logic inside your error handling, and you know it'll be it, it makes uh, it makes it a lot easier to wrap your head around this. And if you think about it, there is a problem with this code, right? So we are doing this for the payment activity. If the payment um, activity fails, but we are not doing this for the inventory activity, right? So it becomes very obvious that we should also be reverting the payment, but we're not doing it. So you can actually catch this during a code review. Imagine, imagine how long it would actually take for you to find find uh, find out about this in all those YAML-based systems where chances are things don't even exist in the same repository. Um, yeah. So 
let me give you an example of the activity. All these are, you know, activities can be anything, any Golang function. The only requirement is that it needs to take a context as a first parameter and return an error at least. Uh, so here I'm just making uh, a HTTP call to this inventory service. Um, I'm just making a post call. And if the post call fails, I'm returning uh, the error for why the post call failed. So obviously I don't have this service running. So, okay, before that, so both these activities and uh, work, uh, workflows need somewhere to run. So that is your worker code. So here, if you see, we have, you know, uh, we are configuring a queue name for the worker and then we are registering every workflow and also every activity with this worker. And then uh, since this is going to run as a Kubernetes pod, we, are, we have set a health endpoint and that's basically it. Now, since this, uh, since this worker is going to be part of a deployment, if you want to increase the throughput of your workflow all you have to do is scale this worker and you know depending on the logic of your workflow code it is going to uh, horizontally scale so this gives you reliability since workflows are durable like anything that you have in the workflow function will complete uh, will actually complete there is no infrastructure failure uh, that can actually prevent the workflow from completing so let's say a, work, a, work, a workflow function is running on a worker and the worker goes down because, you know, for some reason, any reason, um, your spot machine went went out or something like that, any reason, Temple will know to restore that, uh, restore the state of that workflow in a different worker and it will resume the workflow. So, you know, that gives you a lot of reliability. Plus, uh, like I showed you, you can handle your failure cases using the error handling constructs in your programming language and you cannot uh, you cannot forget to handle it and you'll catch it during your code review and you also have retries with exponential back off imagine having to reinvent this every time uh, you're sending an external request that could uh, to a flaky service and pretty much anything across network is flaky uh, given long enough time so you would want retries and temple gives you that out of the box so uh, going back to our activity code, since none of those services actually existed, uh, all my attempts are actually, uh, all my tries hitting that service uh, was failing. So if you see, if you look at the standard uh, standard out, um, you can already see that we are attempting it multiple times. So you can see attempt two, attempt three. So, and also you can see that we are in fact hitting this simultaneously. We're not waiting for the payment gateway uh, payment activity to finish in order to hit the inventory activity. So we are trying both of these simultaneously and both of these are failing. And you uh, just by looking at uh, this, you will um, just by looking at your logs, you can tell that, you know, this is the activity that's failing. Plus, uh, Temporal also gives you, uh, comes with a web UI, uh, just like Kubernetes. So that's an optional piece that you can install. So this will give you a, a bird's eye view of all the workflows that are running and all the runs that we have. So you can go inside any of these runs and it will give you the entire event history of everything that happened. So here you can see on line 13 that this is the reason, uh, you know, this is this is the part that is failing and it will give you the reason for the failure and uh, the number of tries. So this is now here it says attempt five. So this is it, this this part is being this activity is being tried for the fifth time. And now since that also failed, it says maximum attempt reached. Right, so, and th that was on reliability. And on scalability, uh, so part of the reason why you end up with hundreds or thousands of microservices is one, it's convenient to start uh, start a uh, whole project from scratch, but also because people try to tend to prematurely decouple services in anticipation of future scale, right? People might think, hey, maybe today I'm getting only hundreds of requests, but in the future, this can potentially have uh, hundreds of thousands of requests. So let me actually decouple this and put this as a separate service so that I don't have to uh, decouple that at the time. And because people have uh, burnt their fingers trying to de decouple monolithic uh, machines, right? So people uh, want to prematurely decouple services these days. And but you don't have to do that in case of Temporal. So all you have to do, let's say, let's take this example. Uh, so you have three activities running and let's say, for example, on line, line 15, uh, let, uh, the payment activity needs to run at a different concurrency. And let's say it's also an expensive call. 
all you have to do is just remove this activity from this worker and create a new worker, register that activity over there, and now deploy this worker in a separate de Kubernetes deployment. It can scale that independently. And here, if you see, we I've also set the concurrency uh, to six. The default is thousand. So you can have only six instances of this activity running uh, for this worker at any given time. So that way you won't be uh, bombarding the payment service with a lot of requests. If you have especially burst traffics, uh, you'll only be handling six requests at a time. Um, and you don't have to also prematurely decouple services because it's as simple as just unregistering an activity and registering it in a different worker. So if you think about it, uh, I mean, I'm sure all of you have uh, services at your company that do not really get a lot of traffic, but still need their own deployment because there is no other way to deploy it. There are services that hardly get 100 requests a day, uh, but they run as dedicated services, right? But with Temple, you don't need dedicated services for that. Uh, you can just that can just be another activity uh, executing uh, the logic inside uh, inside the activity function itself, and this can get scheduled um, whenever it is required. So that way, that also reduces the number of microservices that you need, and your application can be made of thousands of workflows and the all these workflows can actually be executed concurrently so let's say you are building a complex uh, application there is no limit to the number of workflows that an application can have in fact we have uh, every day we run 200000 workflows um, and also if you are, there is no limit to the number of activities your uh, workflows can execute the only limit is uh, you can have only 50,000 events and you can basically work around that event, uh, that limitation by creating child workflows and making sure that no child workflow has more than 50,000 uh, events in, in the event history. So one more thing. Now, if you remember the beginning of my talk, I told you part of the problem is also all these infrastructure automation tools for which you have to write config, right? What if your application can bring its own infrastructure. Uh, imagine at the, at the beginning of the workflow, you have an activity that talks to the uh, talks to the ASG using AWS SDKs or CDK, anything, and uh, increases the ASG count. Let's say you start with five, you increase that to ten at the beginning of the workflow, and then you talk to the Kubernetes APIs to increase the pod count, and then you execute your business logic, the actual uh, logic that you want to execute uh, that we built in the previous screen, for example, the commerce workflow, you execute that as a child workflow. And then on the way out, you can um, you can decrease the pod count, decrease the ASG size, and also maybe perhaps send a Slack notification indicating the workflow completion. Uh, and you did all this without using a single, uh, without writing a single line of YAML. So yeah, I mean, your application can bring its own infrastructure. So other use cases, we have uh, we have a lot of these DAG-based systems like data pipelines, the, the ELT pipelines, um, and machine learning pipelines. All these actually tend to naturally lend itself to uh, Temporal because uh, Temporal DAG-based DAG pipelines are a subset of what Temporal can do. And also CI CD systems, like I showed you in the previous example, can very easily become, uh, you know, temporal workflows, and making them temporal workflows gives you a lot of opens up a lot of possibilities. Uh, running smoke tests, running integration tests, running chaos tests, all those kinds of uh, tests can be done. Um, you, you get a lot of uh, flexibility. You can also, uh, aside from this DAG-based uh, systems, you can also build complex event-driven systems. So, uh, temporal gives you a construct called Signal. Uh, so just like how you can wait on a Golang channel, you can wait on uh, an entire uh, workflow. Um, so your workflow execution is going to halt until you know you receive a signal from that signal. I mean, you, re you receive an input from that signal. And one more thing that you can do is you can uh, build your own DSL-based workflows. Let's say you, you already have some DSL that you want to execute. You can use Temple 
to write an interpreted uh, write an interpreter for the dsl who can execute that come on a quick time check yep yeah closing thoughts closing thoughts so you don't need me to tell you how powerful an abstraction can be you already saw that with uh, linux containers uh, with docker and the kind of impact that it did uh, kind of impact that it had you already saw that with kubernetes services and the kind of impact that it it had so few years ago we had this serverless movement at the peak of the serverless movement we had pretty much every single cloud company uh, come up with an offering and also uh, a promise a promise that developers wouldn't and shouldn't have to deal with all this glue code around their uh, business code and that ops will also be taken care of seamlessly so but that kind of fizzled out right so now here is a system that helps you check a lot of these boxes although in a different way so uh, with this you know temple might just be the system that fulfills the promise of serverless and uh, with all this unlocked productivity imagine the possibilities so thank you that was my talk um,